Hi everybody. Um, good afternoon. Happy Tuesday. So I decided to do this broadcast in relationship to an amazing article that one of my students from a course that I just ran, Ellie Cohen, thank you Ellie, <laughs> sent to me. The article, or rather the research study, is called, I have to scroll up, this is a multitask, Common and Dissociable Neural Activity After Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction and Relaxation Response Programs. So that probably sounds like a real mouthful, but let me explain so that it's in context. The object of this study was to understand both psychologically and neurologically how activities that activate the relaxation response differ in their effects versus activities related to mindfulness. So not everybody is probably clear on what the relaxation response is. So before I go into the paper, I want to describe that briefly. So in the late 60s, early 70s, the famous Dr. Herbert Benson, often considered the father of mind-body medicine, did research providing evidence for something that meditators have long known, that there is a state when we relax in a very particular way, not just kind of like, you know, you hang out, you're sleeping, but actually in a focused context, when one relaxes, there is this change that occurs physiologically. And his initial research on this was determining that there was a reduction in oxygen consumption during the, this point of relaxation. And what that suggests is that the rate of metabolic activity, the need of energy for the cells was going down. And this reduction in the first paper that he published was 13% against the normative population, which is, by the way, much lower than individuals even in a period of sleep. Okay, fast forward now to 2018, and a team at Harvard, still including himself, he's still doing research, he's not a young man, but he's amazing and brilliant, have been looking really aghast for like the last, maybe even 15 years, about how activating the relaxation response can evoke genetic change. And they have been finding that in just eight weeks, there are significant genetic changes for the better that occur. Those genetic changes relate to the upregulation or the further manifestation of genes that people already have. So it's not like you could change your genome, right? To increasing and then negative things decreasing. So positive things might be like increasing certain processes through the formation of particular biochemicals that are involved in the creation of cells in the hippocampus, a part of the brain involved in resiliency and many other things. And downregulation of genes involves in inflammation, just as an example. Okay, so relaxation response versus mindfulness. Now this is interesting to me just anyway because I love physiology, I study physiology, but it's also interesting because yoga is unique in that it duly works on activating the relaxation response at certain times while also naturally imparting mindfulness. Now before, I know this, this is a little long, but I think that this is important to understand before I get into the article. So when we are involved in pranayama, when we do shavasana, for example, we have the potential of activating the relaxation response. Benson found through his methodology that he developed, where he would say, relax your feet, relax your legs, relax your belly, relax your shoulders quite quickly, and then ask people to have one word and just repeat it over and over and over with non-judgmental awareness of that word and attending often to the breath, that people would enter this state. And we can do this, he has found, through prayer, through uh, shavasana, through yoga nidra, through pranayama, through many, many different mechanisms that are available to human beings and that are personally um, considered useful. Mindfulness, on the other hand, um, which I hope you know, because this is not gonna be a discussion about specifically what mindfulness is. Mindfulness is naturally evoked through yoga without trying on purpose to activate it. Because for example, you're in a challenging pose and you will sense your body and the sensations coming from the body because they're gross sensations, whether you want to or not. 
Now in traditional mindfulness practice, you might just sit present, noticing sensations in your body by directing your attention there. But through the practice of asana, without even trying, that occurs. So yoga is not the only mind-body practice that naturally evokes the relaxation response and mindfulness, but it is a practice that definitively does this. And I think does this fantastically. So understanding that, I'd like to speak to what the article found regarding the difference in what happens when we activate the, the um, relaxation response versus mindfulness, and then to consider the overall effect of both. So I'm going to list the paper here for those of you that want to read it. The research was conducted by Sarah Lazar. If you're not familiar with who she is, she is the individual who in 2005 published research finding that mindfulness meditation was associated in long-term practitioners with thicker prefrontal cortical volume. As the prefrontal cortex naturally thins with age, this was an exciting finding suggesting protective benefits through the practice of mindfulness. The prefrontal cortex helps to downregulate the stress response and also provides the capacity for innovative thinking, the fresh mind, flexible intelligence, all things that we want to continuously promote. Okay, enough explaining. So what the research team found psychologically was interesting. So individuals who were practicing mindfulness, and they looked specifically at individuals practicing mindfulness-based stress reduction, had a greater capacity to reduce rumination and a greater sense of self-compassion. And that's not surprising because in mindfulness meditation, you are not actively attempting to relax, but you're noticing the mind every time it goes out to something, you're seeing the thought. And as you see the thought, you're actually coming back naturally without attempting to, to the present moment. This is different than if you're constantly just saying, I'm focusing on this one thing, just this one thing, just this one thing. That will be very relaxing as uh, research has shown even here. But when you're not doing that actively, you may not notice the discussions that the mind is having, like when you're walking down the street or you're on the tube or doing something of that nature. Hence, in daily life, rumination is much more likely to continue. Likewise, with the compassion piece, when you see how much negative self-talk you have, as we all do, what starts to occur is this sense of, wow, I should be kinder to myself. It's hard to have this mind. Look at how much I judge myself. And slowly arises this insight that thoughts are coming that are constantly causing pain. So it's not unsurprising to determine that. Alternatively, it's also not surprising to de determine through this research that the relaxation response is better able to enhance inhibitory control and has for individuals a greater influence immediately on the autonomic nervous system. So for example, people who are practicing relaxation response-like activities can more easily activate the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. And that makes complete sense because mindfulness is not actively attempting to do this, right? It may be a byproduct, but in the relaxation response, it is a goal. Now, in terms of brain structures, I'm not going to get deep into neuroscience here. You can look at the paper yourself if you want to understand more. But I'll just say this. It was determined in this research study that in mindfulness-based stress reduction, there was definitively more activity in parts of the brain associated with awareness of the body, awareness of things in general. Whereas alternatively, once again, uh, uh, also correlated with the psychological piece, there was more activity in parts of the brain supporting inhibition. The one, I guess, curveball of this research, and the researchers were very curious and they, they thought maybe there was a problem, maybe they need to do it again, and I agree. It, it's uh, something out of the ordinary and definitely more research needs to be conducted to look at this. They actually found 
that individuals doing the relaxation response on mindfulness scales were more mindful afterwards than the people practicing mindfulness. And they couldn't make heads or tails of it. I feel the same. I can't really make heads or tails of it, except to say one thing. Maybe it's the case that if you truly relax, that you are better able to see your mind. And I think coming back to the value of yoga, I think that's something that yoga really offers that is a great support for the practice of mindfulness, that through pranayama, through practices that help the mind and body to calm down, that activate the parasympathetic response, the mind is not as busy and a capacity to be mindful is thereby enhanced. So although it is quite a strange finding, in some ways it makes sense to me. I look forward to further research to find if this is the case in other studies. But any way you write it, it demonstrates the fact that there are actual different effects of mindfulness and relaxation. And that I believe, because they didn't look at the combined effect, that if you want the maximum benefit, you either want to engage in both types of practices or engage in a practice that naturally includes both, like yoga. And not just an asana practice, but a yoga practice that includes pranayama, that includes savasana, that includes meditation afterwards. Anyway, that's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I've been speaking off the cuff, so if anything's not clear, I apologize, but uh, the paper's here, so hopefully you can make sense of it for yourself. Namaste. Thank you.